Welcome to Building New York. My name is Michael Stoller. Two and a half years ago, the Time Warner Center opened in Columbus Circle. Many people consider the Time Warner Center the Rockefeller Center of the 21st century. Today, I have an individual who is the co-developer of the Time Warner Center, an individual responsible for major developments in Paramus, Hackensack, all over the country, the chairman, the founder of Apollo Real Estate Advisors, the chairman of the board of Mac Cali Realty, also the senior partner of the Mac Company, Bill Mack, William Mack. Thank you for being here. Thank you for having me. So, how did this guy who grew up, who was born on Montgomery Street in Brooklyn, get involved, uh, you know, um, in, in the real estate business? You, you went to, you were in Montgomery Street in Brooklyn, and then you moved to Queens, and then you went to Brooklyn Tech. What happened after Brooklyn Tech? Um, I was all set to be an engineer, a structural engineer. My father felt that was a profession he wanted to be, and he never went to college. So I was about to go to, to RPI, and I, I really would have made perhaps a mediocre engineer at best. And I said to my, my dad, I said, you know, if I may not like engineering, so let me go to Penn, University of Pennsylvania, and if I don't like it after the first year, I can switch to the Wharton School. And uh, I knew I was going to switch to the Wharton School practically before that, and that's what happened. I, I went to Penn for a year, I transferred to Wharton, and um, uh, although I, f I, f I finished up at uh, NYU because I had mono in between, so the last I spent about two and a half years at Wharton and about a year at NYU finishing up uh, my studies at the School of Commerce, it was called then. So now you're, what, you're 22 years of age and you, you get a job as a leasing broker? Well, I, I, the job I got was at a, f a firm called Robert Joseph and Company. They were leasing brokers, but Bob Joseph, um, who was quite active in the business, never had any equity interests. And here I was, this uh, brash, smart young man, I uh, hope, um, and I was going to be partners with him in doing equity deals. And so when I came in, uh, we started looking at things to buy. Um, and that quite never worked out, but I certainly did learn a lot in the eight or nine months that I was there about um, the industrial real estate business. And then you went out to Jersey. I mean, you, your father, the family was in Queens. Your father had built certain warehouses and loft buildings in Maspeth and other neighborhoods. You decided to go out to New Jersey. Why New Jersey? Well, I, I saw at Robert Joseph that uh, most of the inquiries other than Manhattan and really the bulk of the inquiries around the metropolitan area for new warehouse space were in New Jersey. New Jersey was a foreign place to me, so I started looking around and started seeing what was available, but I saw that there was a trend by being in his office um, based upon the requirements. Uh, he sent out a lot of uh, advertising mail and they'd come back and uh, he'd just farm them out to the different places and he'd keep the ones that were uh, New York uh, loft, you know, loft leads. And now you're, you're 22 or 23, you take a trailer, right? You took a trailer and, and you decided to build a loft building. Tell us about that. No, it was a, well, lofts were not in my no, no, I mean, vocabulary. It was one story industrial, what? that was what it was. but. Um, we came upon a piece of land that was affordable and that was well located it was f and was good for someone to start business in. It was a five and a half acre piece in North Bergen, New Jersey, near the Lincoln Tunnel. And um, we finally closed title uh, in probably June. And I went, uh, I set up a trailer on the site. Uh, didn't get, uh, I couldn't get air conditioning because it took two months, so I, had, I was in a trailer and I was a developer. We started taking fill from New York uh, to fill in some of the meadowlands or swamps as, as we called it. Um, I, hired, uh, I hired a young law student to count the loads of fill. He eventually became one of the chief judges of New Jersey. Um, and I was in business. I was a developer. And um, oh, I, so, what was the? It was a paint company. I think you said the to me. first building I built was mostly office, a little warehouse for a company called Luminol Paints. It was a thirteen thousand square foot building. It was a build to suit. And we, after that, on the five and a half acre piece came a forty six thousand uh, square foot building um, 
for a company called Art Award. If you remember, it was the paint by the numbers. We made a lease with Fairbanks Valve uh, for 24,000 feet. And we decided, uh, since we had three rented buildings, we put up a spec for 50,000 feet. And we were fortunate enough that was rented uh, mostly by GE and a company called Dato. And uh, I was a developer. You know, we had a prop, uh, a very successful 135,000 square foot development. And from there on, we bought some more land, and uh, we hooked up two trailers, and they were nicer trailers. <laughs> and uh, from that time, we were in business, and we started expanding um, into building what turned out to be the larger warehouses at the time in New Jersey. Now, I remember reading that some of you, you were one of the largest developers in Paramus and the Meadowlands. What gave you the impetus to go to those markets to build these uh, uh, warehouses? Well, everything that we did for the first seven or eight years um, was development in the Meadowlands. Uh, we then branched out and did some uh, development in Middlesex County, some warehouse development in Middlesex County. But it wasn't until we got into the office, build, the office buildings that we developed in, uh, in the Paramus area. So it was mostly Hudson County, um, North Bergen, Sea Caucus, and Middlesex County, Piscataway, and Edison in, in the first seven or eight years. And in that time, we probably built eight or nine million square feet of warehouse buildings, um, maybe close to 10, mostly on a build-to-suit basis. I would say that no more than 5% of those buildings were built on speculation. So we have a 29-year-old with how many square feet of uh, warehouse building? Oh, well, I was probably, by the time I was 30, it was probably seven or eight million going to 10 million of warehouse stuff. Of warehouse and and then how how did you decide to, I think the first one was in Fort Lee? First, first office building was in Fort Lee, that's correct. The, the Nissan? Yes, Nissan, it's uh, Nissan Foods. I did a lot of learning on that office building, that's for sure. And. How, how do you make the transition? How do you change from warehouses, 20-foot 20, 20 warehouses, to office buildings? Was it built on spec, or did you have a tenant? No, the office buildings were generally built on spec. Um, but I, you know, I saw that um, I lived in Great Neck at the time. I used, to, I used to travel from Great Neck to New Jersey, where our office was. And I saw a few, uh, a few people in, um, in Nassau County putting up office buildings. And the margins of profit on office buildings were probably almost double what the margins of profit per dollar of rent was on uh, warehouse buildings. And uh, so I started to take a look at it. And I said to myself, well, I don't know anything about office buildings, but you know, I think I'm a smart or smarter than these uh, two young fellows that were kind of friends and acquaintances of mine putting up these buildings. So let me try to study a little bit about it and uh, let me see exactly what the trend is in, in, in office buildings. And as I looked around I, and as I started to look at the marketplace, there was a trend then for manufacturing to service jobs um, and as well a trend towards suburban uh, office buildings where people could live and work uh, very close, and so I decided to slowly um, diversify what we were doing and get into the office development, um, which we did uh, over the next several years quite successfully. Now, you said to me um, your dad, your grandfather, was in the um, basically in the demolition business. That's correct. And uh, your dad followed his footsteps. They were never developers. They they were they took down land. They took down buildings. I mean, uh, they were involved with uh, Stuyvesant Town, uh, the demolition of the, the well, World's Fair, I think. Yeah. Well, basically, my uh, my grandfather was in the demolition business, and he bought some apartment houses and lost most of them in the Depression, or sold them, or had to give them up. As and, uh, and you had made a nice comment to me the other day that your dad said, "I'm never going to be a janitor." Well, he, you know, when he was just getting into business, it was his job to collect the rent. <laughs> And sometimes he'd be propositioned because the people just didn't have the money, you know. Um, and it, as well, you know, in those days, every you know, the the generation, the first and second generation, bought as as is today, they bought very highly leveraged situations. 
And um, by the time the depression hit, the buildings were really owned by the banks. And where they were, where you had forbearance, it was only uh, taking care of the bank, the buildings for the banks. And my father always said he, you know, in that time we were just janitors for the real owners, which were the banks. Right, but I think your, your dad, let him rest in peace, said, in the, de in the Depression, I swore off real estate. Everybody lost all their real estate they had. But I said I wasn't going to get into that. But real estate was my first love. And as soon as I got fresh capital, I got back in it. That's true. That's true. He always used to say that um, uh, real estate is the only business that you can be in when, where you make money while you sleep. Now, you said it was interesting that your dad took down properties and sold the land, uh, sold the, the wood. Uh, maybe explain that to my audience. Well, the, the way my father got into, back into the real estate business was right after World War II when he, was, he did the demolition for Stuyvesant Town and Peter Cooper Village. Uh, you know, it's, it's, it's interesting, but in, uh, quietly in the news, there are, there are more than rumors that those buildings will be put up for sale for the first time in, uh, in, 60, in years. Six, 60 years. And when he p took down all of these buildings, he, had more, he, he accrued more secondhand lumber than was in the entire market. So rather than flood the market, he bought some land to ha just, to, just to sell the lumber off slowly in Maspeth and Long Island City. And after he sold off the lumber, he, he got into the new lumber business, which after the war was, you know, was, was, was successful. But he had some surplus land. And he looked at that land, and there seemed to be warehouses being built around. So he started building. Every year he'd build a warehouse on spec, and after he'd rented, he'd build another warehouse. He'd buy a little bit more land in addition to building buildings for himself. He got into the military packaging business, from the lumber business to the box business, to the military packaging business. So he'd build a warehouse and, uh, you know, and, and, he'd, and he'd use it for a while and move out of that warehouse and then rent it. And that was a source of also some real estate development for him. But when you went into the new Mac company, right. it was your business. Your dad wasn't there, but you said to me, that when he turned 65, he used to guarantee some of the loans. He yeah, helped, that's helped, correct. He what? guaranteed, and then it, it, on his 65th birthday, he said to you, Bill, no more guarantees, right? Well, I remember it was, the, uh, it was spring of 1974, and he was 65, and here we, you know, he was, he had put up, you know, the money to start all of my brothers and myself off, and and he was, you know, he was part of the business, obviously, um, and you know, he he tried, you know, he tried to do everything non-recourse, but he had a guarantee at least completion on the buildings, even though they were rented, and at one time we had 15 uh, buildings going at a time, and uh, he was quite nervous about it. Um, because he was a product of the Depression. So when it came that we could fly on our own, he was delighted not to have to guarantee completion or guarantee. Well, he would never guarantee a loan, but uh, guaranteeing completion when you're building in the Meadowlands and you really don't know, you know what you run into is not, is not an easy task. So uh, he stopped guaranteeing anything after that, and he was a lot more comfortable because uh, at that age, at, at, you know, 65 uh, then, then was is different than 65 now. And uh, 65 was the real retirement age. So he could write the banks and say, you know, I'm 65 years old and I'm retirement age and so I shouldn't guarantee anything. And it worked. Now, you have uh, three other brothers. Yes. All, all three were part of the Mac company? Well, when we started off, we were all partners and we're still partners in a lot of things together. My older brother Earl came uh, with us almost came with with the firm almost uh, practically immediately when we bought the five and a half acres of land my brother David came a few years later and my brother Fred was sporadically in and out of the business um, you know over the years but he's much younger he's um, 12 and a half years younger than I am now when did you make you know we're showing the water over here when did you make the transition leaving uh, New Jersey? Um, because you were, you were building also in Rockland at that time? 
Um, we were building at, at the time um, in, uh, in Florida, a little bit in Tampa, and we had started, um, uh, we, we had started buying some of the RTC properties in, uh, in 91 in Texas, and we had a small operation in Phoenix as well. Right, but you, you said to me pr when we met that in 1985, you thought like you were the master of the universe? Well, no, I said that in 1985, a lot of the real estate okay. people felt they were masters of the universe. And you went into the stock. And you, we went, you became a trader. Well, of course, you know, uh, interest rates dropped significantly. Everyone was able to refinance their buildings. Their equity was worth a heck of a lot of money because cap rates were lower. And naturally, you, you know, uh, when a group makes a lot of money very quickly, they 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 kind of think they're invincible. So we did a little in the stock market. We did a little bit in the takeover market. We found out we weren't so in invincible. We didn't lose any money. We had some good ones, some bad so, ones. It so, made a little bit, but it was interesting. But, you know, you, you've spoken at Wharton. You've spoken all around the country. And, and you, you've always said there, and we all know, there, there are cycles in the real estate business. And you've seen the ups and the downs. And you were talking about 1991, the RTC. The real estate market was in the in the crapper, as one would it's say. In the toilet, exactly. Uh, and you took the advantage and you seized the opportunity. What did you do? Well, it it goes back to uh, um, it, it goes back to the crash um, um, in October of 1987, and in that crash, um, I was heavily involved in equities in the stock market and. Uh, and I had a severe hit to my liquidity. And I started to look out and I said, and I said to myself that um, this, this, can, this can happen in the, and is likely to happen in the real estate business. I had been rather conservative on the real estate side since 85 when I thought that uh, supply was running very much ahead of, ahead of demand. In the suburbs originally supply and demand both expanded arithmetically. Then the supply, um, the supply um, started to expand geometrically, and the demand kept expanding arithmetically, and, and there was a pretty good gap. And I felt that the uh, crash of the stock market was perhaps a precursor of the demand slowing down with the supply going up in the real estate business. So what I did in 88, um, and I, I realized the, um, my plan by the late summer of 88 was to take every large office space that we had and try to renew a, a series of leases. And I remember I wrote down 14 things and probably encompassed about renewals on 3 million square feet of office buildings, and I was successful on renewing about 2.7 million square feet, 12 of the things I was able to accomplish. So when by 1989, when the downturn was evident, and when every when everything went into the proverbial crapper, um, we we were a lot better rented, and we were a lot more liquid because of our ability to uh, refinance the buildings, and we were able to, we had some dry powder, and we were able to take advantage somewhat of the downturn and buy some buildings from the RTC and. Uh, in 91. Right. Now, you, one of the first buildings that you got involved in in New York City was tr in Tribeca. Yes, that's correct. That, But that's after um, we started, um, uh, I, I, I decided that, you know, I would like to do something on my own. And in 1993, uh, we formed Apollo Real Estate. And it was about the fall of 1993 that um, we uh, uh, we bought Tribeca, Tribeca Towers, which is uh, which was a failed condominium, a 50-story failed condominium um, on um, Broadway, uh, right off Broadway and, and on Duane Street. I remember going down there on a Saturday and taking a look around and uh, with my son Richard, who was just fresh out of law school, and we both looked at each other and we said, who would want to live here? And we said, it was a Saturday or a Sunday. And then we came back, started looking a little bit more, and we said, you know, this doesn't look too bad. And so we were successful in buying uh, the mortgage and in, uh, and in getting rid of uh, the limited partnership that had invested with it. And that was one of the first deals that we bought 
um, in New York, and we still have that building. And then you bought, what, 237 Park? Well, what we did is um, we there was a group of bonds at that time called the 970s. It was a $970 million re, uh, financing that was done for Olympia and York. And the bonds were selling at 50 cents on a dollar, and they were current pay, and they were paying 7% on 50 cents, which is 14% on, they were paying 7% on 100, which is 14% so on 50 relative, cents. So a good yield. So it's a good yield, and we bought those buildings for about $140 a square foot. So on a replacement or a per pound basis, it, it certainly looked reasonable. But we, you know, in 1993, uh, the end of 93, we were, we were still in very bad times. Uh, but it, you could see glimmers of recovery. At least it had bottom, bottomed out. And so those three buildings, which were two Broadway, 237 Park, and 1290 Avenue of the Americas, uh, we bought a, a controlling position um, in those bonds. And uh, the only thing that was, that was unrented at the time and, or had just lost a big tenancy, uh, and I think Drexel Burnham was, had moved out of uh, two Broadway. It was two Broadway. It was two Broadway. And so that was bleeding the ability of the bonds to pay the dividend. And um, we, uh, Two Broadway was sold for the uh, great sum of either 15 or $18 million for uh, a million and a half square feet. That's the real estate game. And that's the real estate game. How, how, do, you, how do you get involved with uh, the Time Warner Center? And tell, tell my audience a little bit about when you were 13 years of age in the Coliseum. Well, it was very interesting. I, the last demolition job that my dad did was he, uh, he, he made way for the, uh, for the Coliseum and the MTA building. And it was a very important step for the city to get the Coliseum, which was the convention center, done very quickly. And so there was a bonus and a penalty, and uh, Robert Moses paid my dad a bonus, and he was very happy. He talked about it for the rest of his life. In any event, when I went to the job, I was 13 years old. The neighborhood was not a very good neighborhood. And so he looked at me, and I remember to this day saying, son, you know, this will be a good neighborhood uh, someday. It's becoming a good neighborhood. Well, I looked around. It didn't look like a great neighborhood to me, but I remember that day. And... Um, and he and the Coliseum went up, and and then um, I remember I was um, on the uh, board of what was was the Urban Development Corporation at at the time, it's Empire State Development Corporation. Um, when um, when the site was sold originally, and it was supposed to be headquarters for Solomon Brothers. Uh, that fell through. We went into the real estate recession uh, or depression, and uh, it was put on the market again. And we had done a number of um, jobs with uh, related with Steve Ross, and as a matter of fact, Tribeca Tower was the first one. And we decided to team up and uh, and try to be in uh, in the bidding um, for the um, uh, for the demolition of the Col Coliseum and and for what today is Time Warner Center. Are you, were you surprised about the success of the Time Warner Center? No, um, we we were very bullish when we went into uh, into the development, and times were very good, and it looked like we were going to hit a home run with Time Warner Center. Um, what we did is we tried to mitigate the what would, what appeared to be the difficult parts before we went ahead of it ahead with it and the difficult parts were the hotel where we got a 50 percent uh, partner and the um, and the office space which we sold 80 to 90 percent um, to um, uh, to time Warner at you know cost plus um, a, a small profit and we looked to the big profits in the condominiums and in the retail and hoped we wouldn't lose any money in the hotel and everything was going terrific and it looked like things were going to work out and we and we started to market the condominiums in September of 2001 then uh, on, then we then came September 11th a recession um, the war in Iraq SARS, um, a, um, 
uh, a fire which caused a flood. I, I could go on. It was like we had the ten plagues at that building. Uh, but notwithstanding going through everything that we went through, the job is a good job. Um, it, 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 it made money. It produced a very satisfactory return. Um, and, but instead of being a blowout and instead of going over the top, uh, since it was, I believe, well done and well planned, we were able to come out very nicely, notwithstanding all the difficulties that we went through. And, and now, uh, over the next couple of months, a couple of months ago, you bought linens and things, and uh, next month you're, uh, or in the next two months, you're going to be closing on the acquisition of Lord & Taylor? That's correct. So you're going to become a, a retailer right now? Yeah, back to the old trade. Yeah. Back to the old, old trade. <laughs> and, and, you know, what you, uh, what Apollo and, I mean, Matt Cowley is one of the largest REITs in the country with more real estate in the Northeast than most uh, REITs. Um, you have truly uh, been involved with uh, building New York and the tri-state region. And I'd like to thank you for being here today. Well, I thank you very much. It's a great pleasure to be here with okay, you. Okay, great. Thank <laughs> you.